You know what's wild is like we really just heard those instructions for the first time. <laughs> yeah. And we're so excited that Michelle knows what's happening. Yeah. Because we were just going to talk you. and like we don't know if anyone would have been involved. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, so this is great. This is like our second date. It's awesome. Yeah. I think it's it's feeling how you feeling about it so far? Like, it's been going good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We met know. each other for the first time yesterday. Mm -hmm. We ate to... tacos on our first date. You know, yes. tacos yes. are supposed to not be first date food, but here oh, we are. I didn't are. know that. Right? Dang. Like get messy in front of people. I was like, ooh, yeah, dropping yeah. sauce is fine. Um so I feel like, you know, what we were talking about, we named this session something. Do you do you know what the name of this session is? Uh, it was about creativity and leadership mm -hmm. and how we merge that mindset into what we do on a day to day. Yeah. And I think like in our, in our talking, we were like kind of in the spirit of Jay-Z. It's important that we re reintroduce ourselves mm -hmm. like with self for self, um, where we get away from defining ourselves by what we do. And like, really, who's the essence? So I'm going to just, on this here podcast, I'm going to um, <laughs> yes. use my podcast voice. Um, so Chicle, let's, let's let, allow you to reintroduce yourself. Who are you? Yeah, so I'm a San Diego native, um, born and raised here. Only time I spent away was to go away for college, uh, something that in my group of friends, I was the only one to go um, and has allowed me to live a life that I never dreamed of. Mm -hmm. um, education, and in particular, being an assistant principal, AKA Dean of Culture, is not something that I ever uh, considered for myself. Um, I loved art always, you know, in San Diego, I would argue that San Diego in the 90s when I was a teenager um, had the best graffiti. Um, obviously, I'm Don't biased. Words. Obviously, I'm biased. <laughs> and um, that was the thing I loved, right? Art, um, making t shirts. I'm a screen printer, you know, so I'm an artist, screen printer, graphic designer. I'm a dad. My son's in the back playing a video game, um, you know, and an educator. So, um, there's so many layers mm -hmm. to who we are, and, and that's part of what we were talking about yeah. yesterday of like all the things that we bring to our, our work. Um, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I am, I like to say I'm a, I'm a seed planter, I'm a soil agitator, I'm a curious and passionate artist and educator, um, I'm a joy ambassador, I'm the recess president. Uh, energy DJ. Um, I just try to show up. I'm someone that tries to show up and be a conduit for joy, for liberation. Um, I think of myself as the two-step whisperer. I really believe mm. I can get anybody to dance on beat. Mm -hmm. um, but you know you got to pay for my services because uh, that is a lot of time put in. Um, and even probably more importantly, I'm the fourth born to Marsha Denise Washington and William Donald Upchurch from the north side of St. Louis. And being fourth, hey, oh wow, that is a rare woo. <laughs> Three, one, four, shown up in the building. Never get to say that, okay, and back. Um, and being fourth born really, I think, is so critical to who I am and how I navigate the world. Um, because looking at what my older brother and two older sisters did and just having to naturally kind of be like the, do what your siblings are doing, go where mm. they are. I'm like the like, I'm just always there, the, the extra person doing all the things and not in a burdensome way, but it was very natural to be around older, still younger, but older, uh, kids, but then also around aunties, grandmas, people I didn't share blood with, but I thought were blood cousins. Yeah. And I think that really identify, like really names rather, how I identify 
as an educator. So any title can be affixed to my name or removed, but I'm still that girl who lives and thrives in community, who doesn't know the world without music, dance, chanting, laughter, double dutch. I, do, I don't have it on me here in San Diego, but I am known to like whip out a double dutch rope. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, listen. Anyway, that's nice. for a whole different podcast, but I, yeah. that's who I am. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm this. I, I, I love being in intergenerational spaces. I love joy. I love games. I love play. That is how we learn. And um, yeah, that's yeah. who I am. I love that. And I, I think being so. I mentioned I'm a San Diego native, but you know, my parents crossed the border in the '60s. My dad, Jose Luis, who came over with a, a little piece of paper that said looking for work you know he didn't speak english cruised up and down harbor drive so for those of you that are here for the first time or if you visited harbor drive is the road where the airport is um, if you take that all the way south you, you hit pretty much national city um so he came over with that piece of paper and he shares a story of like walking into spaces or, or businesses and people laughing people making comments and I'm like all the opposite of that, you know, like I would never, I don't, I don't I want to say never, but like, I don't think I would have done that mm -hmm. or had the courage to just put myself in such a vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, situation. Uh, my mom, Elia, is from Tijuana, you know, so growing up, I thought I was Mexican um, because I crossed the border multiple times a week, spent time with family, cousins, mm -hmm. you know, big, big family. Um, but I'm like the youngest or second youngest on both sides of my family. Mm. So my sister, who's 10 years older, is really the only reason I went to college because she did. And she's 10 years older. So she's almost like a, a second mom to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she looked out for me, you know, made sure that my mom put me in preschool, made sure that, you know, I, had, I took care of my grades um, and then ultimately told me, like, you're going to college, period. Um, so I went. Um, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do or who I mm -hmm. wanted to be other than enjoying art, music, well, live music, yeah. you know, and I think being in community, as you were saying, is, is something that's a really big part of who I am and, and what I try to bring to school with me. Um, so as a classroom teacher, that was a big part of, you know, we were talking about this, this space, which is typically set up in a circle. Mm -hmm. Um, my room was always that, you know, and, and because of the tables or the furniture I had, it was a rectangle. Right. But yeah, everyone yeah. Could, was facing in and seeing each other. Exactly. There's there's something really unique about oh, that. Oh yeah. I mean, I feel that because I think if there were like chapters or track titles to my life, if my life were an EP, either the EP is called Cipher is Life or it's like the title track. I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, when you grow up youngest, like my brother is 10 years older than me than my oh, wow. sister's eight years. So we, we are, and then there's one that's four older, but the eight-year-old sister felt like junior mama. Mm -hmm. And in my little girl math, like my brother just seemed bigger than any human I had met. <laughs> And then as I got older, like, I don't understand math a lot because I'm a dancer and I count to eight and start back over. But when I was like, he's 10 years older than me. That means he's old. Like, I just thought he was the oldest person. But so some, I say that because growing up, if I'm always, if I'm six, I'm inherently around 16-year-olds. If I'm eight, I'm around 18-year-olds. If I'm right. 10, I'm around 20-year-olds. Um, and that intergenerationality felt so so natural and a lot of what we did was in the circle playing outside mm -hmm. um growing up in st louis i'm really uh like thank you for sharing about your your, your parents like my mom's an artist singer dancer my dad was like an activist and we had a community um of all the play cousins and aunties and uncles um and we would celebrate being black and so I also don't know the world like not being proud to be black. I don't leave that part of my identity to be um, policed or minimized by any system or structure. And it's just in games we would play. Like there's like a chant that we would sing called my people, my people, what kind of people? Talking about black people. And I'm like, just to sing that as a kid, like with aunties and cousins and uncles and everybody is like, it's joy to celebrate who we are. And we are growing up in these like games and in drum circles, like everything, like you're able to see everyone. So when I step into a classroom, 
haven't taught from what I call ankle biters because they feel closer <laughs> to my ankles than my like forehead. Uh, from ankle biters to uh, aunties, I always put the room in a circle because again, it's about, I think, coming back home to the things that make you feel the most humanized and held and heard. And it's incredibly noteworthy to me, someone who's taught um, graduate students um, and undergraduate students, the power of K-12 restrictive education that's so like desk in front, face the teacher, like I put a circle of chairs and like tax paying adult students are like, what? Mm. Um, and so I play games with them where I try to remove myself from the circle and they're still like trying to perform their knowledge to me and craning, <laughs> craning their heads around to track me. I'm like, the community is right there. Like talk with each other. Like that is how yeah. we build. And I think so much about like growing up in those West African traditions of dance and singing and then in hip hop, that for me is like a natural, I don't that's so formative to how I'm able to see and navigate the world that like physically organizing spaces into a cipher, but then also thinking around how to invite knowledge metaphorically into a cipher and leadership positions. I'm like, I'm just trying to stay true to my roots. Um, no matter the title or the position or the place, like we're supposed to be in community um, and share that power. So like, it's, um, it's funny to me how simple it seems like yeah. I don't feel like that's really like, whoa, that's so radically creative. <laughs> you have us sitting in a circle and we feel held. I'm like, dang. But it, it, it's what we were talking about yesterday as well with compliance, right? Like mm. we're, we're raised to be compliant and do things as to the, the letter of the instructions, right? And it's mm. funny you mentioned like we just heard the instructions for, <laughs> for right now. Yeah. Uh, we, that's how we're wired, you know? And, and one thing that I've been embracing more and more in my fifth year as, as a dean is the idea that we need to model those expectations for not only our students, but the adults as well, because yeah. most of our adults attended traditional public schools that were about sit, be quiet, take notes, listen, and then memorize, and then give it all back mm -hmm. to me on a test or a quiz, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas we learn in community, we learn through experience, exactly. we learn through exchanges, you know, and, and helping folks be comfortable with that is huge. It's huge. And it's so simple. It could all be so simple. You know, the Reverend <laughs> That's right. Lauren Hill. Yes. Um, thank you for those who picked that up. <clears throat> um, like it, I think it all could be so simple. And I think also the notion of um, art, I think also, and like, how we're surrounded by it. For me, I think it's simple because I don't know the world without it. Like, yeah. you grow up, you go on outside, you, even if we don't call it art, you finna sing, dance, mimic, step, clap, try to like imitate. And that's like a natural way of connecting. Um, and I think about the power of returning to that simple truth of we are creatives. Yeah. Like the creator creates to its own nature. So whatever you call it, like we were talking yesterday, or whoever you call it, we come from a creator. Mm -hmm. So it would violate the constitution of being a human to not create or tap into your creative power because it was always there. And it's just so simple to like come back to that. Simple to come back to that, right? But work of unlearning and the undoing. Mm -hmm. um, so I like, feel like James Baldwin talks about like what's the role of an artist. Um, and as a black woman, I identify very um, proudly, uh, whether that identity is assumed upon me, I do take it again, because I just know the world being proud of being black. I am black, I'm a woman, and I think creating art from where I come from, it's about trying to like get us back to the simple thing of like looking at each other and yeah. laughing and yeah. playing, be like, well, what you got? What you know? Okay, somebody step in a circle, oh, hey, like that is powerful. <laughs> I don't think it's anti-intellectual or anti-rigorous to have fun. That's right. I don't think community is antithetical to success. Right. I think actually it depends on your ability to stay tapped into that essential nugget. And I feel like as an artist and someone who's like, I can't run away from being an artist, it keeps me plugged into like, let me, let me whatever I'm doing, can I be a conduit to help us get back to like seeing each other? And, you know, so yeah. also I'm like, 
you know, my dad got kicked out of two PWIs for advocating for the rights of black students and black faculty. So also, I can't be so shooketh by <laughs> these institutions to, to ignore like their gifts inside of me that can honor what he did, right. but also help all everyone just literally sit in circles and recognize each other's humanity. And so I, again, I think I'm just trying to like keep my roots. Yeah. You know. When protected. I remember something you said about um, helping young people feel held in the space, right? Mm -hmm. So seeing each other and, and really acknowledging we're, we're all here together, right? Yeah. In, in, in essence, we're a reflection of one another. And how do we tap into that when we're dealing with each other as colleagues, but also engaging with our students, you know, and, and really recognizing who they are and what they bring with them to this space? And I, I know that currently it's a very different time for young people, you know, with technology and, and post-pandemic life. Um, but our ability to just connect in that way as, as human beings, right? Like understanding that some people are a little bit younger and we need to be a little more patient and maybe more so than ever. Um, I think in my role that, that's been really the thing that I'm trying to move towards is, is bringing myself, my authentic self. So mm -hmm. even though you said, don't come in all your Padre gear, I did. Said, this is okay. who I am. I actually, I right? was kidding. I was like, please wear <laughs> as much Padre gear as possible. Yeah. But I, yesterday I was telling, when I asked, um, I was mentioning that when I became a dean, I went shopping and bought like bought all the, the dean clothes, right? Like <laughs> the collar the shirt, the, the, mm -hmm. the ties. And then I remembered, and, and I did a, a podcast actually for Unboxed about when I started working as an academic coach, and I would wear my flannels, my cuffed 501s, you know, that's just who I, like the style well, that I are. like. Um, and a kid told me like, hey, like, no one dresses like that here. And it was a kid that I was trying to support, so that was my way in. Mm -hmm. After a few weeks in the role and doing some things that, like I called a kid out after school uh, and I was actually here my first year as a dean. My first four years as a dean were here. I was uh, outside. It was the end of the school day um, and a kid curses. Right. So I went over as the dean. I'm like, hey, like, your watch your York. language. You know, trying to lecture a kid after school and, and, and that exchange. He's like, we are off the clock, first of all. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't I didn't think anything of it. Right. I'm just the dean. So I have to in my mind. Um, it ruined the relationship with that kid mm. to the point that it wasn't until like June. This is like the first week of school. Oh, like a whole right? year. So a whole year to repair that. And throughout that year, I realized that I, I don't need to call every little thing out, right? There's some things that like I cuss here and there, right? <gasps> like it's, it's okay. It happens, right? So like, but the positionality. Yeah of me as a dean, mm -hmm. you know? And so from then on, it's been a journey of like, I'm not just the dean. So I changed my title from dean of students to dean of culture, mm -hmm. right? And, and I talk about discipline, not as discipline, but as support for students, yeah. you know? And, and really like shifting all the language that we use and, and saying it to the adults in the room because then it starts to trickle down to the kids, you yeah. know? And it, it really is like being creative. Absolutely. Because I would say, like, you know, again, that, 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 um, that C word that you brought up earlier, compliance, yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes me wonder, like, as an artist, how do you situate compliance in relation to your creed? Like, you shaking, mm -hmm. nah, no. yo, nah, yo, nah, <laughs> it's no real rules. vocal. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's funny, though, because, like, as a, as a visual artist, I have friends who, who cannot paint any other way than they were taught, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I don't know if that's right or wrong, but like I've always had like a, like I don't like to be restrained, yeah. right? Like I like to go for it. And I think that's been my approach to life is just go for it. <laughs> See if it works, dope. If it doesn't, we re regroup we from and, it. and go back to it, right? And that's, yeah. that's how we learn. That's how we get better. That's how we evolve with like critical feedback. And as an exactly. artist, I you think like you're used to that. Yeah. I mean, listen, if I can't, the, here's why Cypher is life. Again, my upcoming EP to be released. I'm not a, <laughs> not a vocal artist in any way, form. But like, for me anyway, and I think being so informed by hip hop culture, like compliance, 
it's like such a not it's not it it's not it like I gotta be able to get into the cipher I gotta be able to deal with like the A's or the like awkward silence because I Mm -hmm. am not on the level where the cipher is and do I know how to switch up and get back into the pocket with it Um, if anything I think like that is about your ear and like your whole sensorial mm-hmm. full body ear to read and feel the room and again community. Um, and so the rules of the cipher, because there are, they're not meant to like be a code of compliance, but it's really mm-hmm. a code to like invoke more sense of community. Right. And meaning I don't just showboat in the middle and do me for me. It's like I say ciphers have to be I for we. So I get better if we get better. Mm. We get better if I want to get better by being in community with you. And so That's right. I think about like, well, I, had a, I was telling you about the fifth grade classroom that I um, taught in in D.C. that was primarily young boys. And so you can imagine the retail therapy that I <laughs> tried to engage in. Um, Because these young boys already were able to vocalize very clearly that the school gives up on them, polices them. They're like, they just send us to the office. And I was like, I will not be another black body in this school that's just thought of as like the disciplinarian auntie. Mm. Like, I'm not here for that. And so Mm -hmm. I'm going to be creative, even in an environment that is saying, just get these kids to be quiet. I'm like, it's a dance class. I'm going to need some energy and trust that I know how to like work with them when they're having a more of an alien day than their best <laughs> human day. See, we always, we all have an alien day. I got some days I'm like, Aisha, you need to try all the way over. Um, but like the resilience to go, these children are not used to having their identities supported here. I'm going to try to be creative with even how I set up the classroom um, norms and values Mm -hmm. so that their humanity is centered. These little bodies are already used to being policed by the age of 10 and they look like me. Like, how are we going to act? I'm not about to police another black body. Mm -hmm. Like, no. Like, again, my dad got kicked out of two institutions that didn't look like him. So I think about, I look at creativity as a, as like a welcomed outlet against compliance that's just about follow the rule, get these people to be, pre, be productive. Even in faculty meetings, do right. we have to run a meeting that way? Like how come all meetings don't start with music and a dance break? Mm-hmm. We probably all been sitting too long, butt cheeks all clenched and everything. Everybody needs to <laughs> shake them chakras. <laughs> like that's just the yeah. fact, you know? We probably gonna do a chakra shake here in a minute. Yeah. Um, but like just thinking about because but that doesn't look like productive professional behavior. Well, yeah. you know what? It's worked out for me. OK, I get paid right. to make things up and everybody's happy. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I again thinking about the tension between creativity or the relationship between creativity and compliance. I'm like, if I don't I trust myself as an artist, I don't turn that off when I need to be in like the educator shoes, which are the same. They're the same shoes. I teach and I dance and I walk in life in the same ones, literally and metaphorically. So I love like hearing how your practice as a visual artist is like, yeah, but I got to experiment and see what other color can I make. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I got to see like I ruined the the relationship is more important with the student if I show up as my authentic self. Padre gear. Yeah. the, The cuffed 501s yeah. to be very yes, please. precise. Button, button fly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think all of that and something you said about celebrating our students' identity, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think more importantly, acknowledging who they are and mm-hmm. who they show up as, right? Because that's authentically who they are. Um, and I, I think sometimes that gets hard when we're like, all the words you're using, policing them, right? Asking them to be compliant to our rules. And and I think even when we set up norms, do we take the time to define the language? You know, like what does respect mean? Yeah. Um, And something I I learned from a a mentor here in San Diego, Macedonio Arteaga, who does a lot of restorative work. And the one thing that he said to me is like, you know, respect, it, it looks different for all of us. You know, and and he's like, I dealt with a situation where a teacher felt disrespected by the student and the student said some choice words that they shouldn't have. But then when he spoke with the student, the student felt disrespected by the adult because of a comment the adult had made. Right. 
And so then when he sat them both together and they were able to express, you know, this is what respect means to me. And when you said this, as, a, as my teacher, I felt some kind of way, you know, and the teacher was able to realize like, and acknowledge ultimately, like they made a, a poor yeah. choice of language, you know, and I, I think even that, like modeling, what does it look like to have these difficult conversations where sometimes as adults, we should always apologize to students you know you lose nothing when you do that oh yeah. you gain everything because they see you as a human being who also makes mistakes Achille. and and can acknowledge that right. you know yeah let's give these two beautiful Damn. humans a round of applause this is like excellent and just to be clear, I sent the instructions out four times. I know they keep saying that I didn't. Y'all know me. She did. I sent them out. But they're so but creative. We, it they looked just like compliance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Which I totally just get. We're, we were just kidding. making a point. <laughs> um, but um, we're going to now just move into Q&A. And so just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over to you. And we will get this going. Yeah, she did, Thank huh? you, Elise. Mm -hmm. I was feeling like an eager beaver. Um, thank you both so much. I really appreciate learning from you. My question is for you, Aisha. Um, I really appreciate you sharing um, how, you, you know, celebrating yourself through the lens of celebrating blackness was such a dominant part of your childhood and current experience. As a mixed person, uh, that was not part of my experience. And in fact, don't sit on my coffee. Um, and then, you know, uh, there was actually more like implicit messages like don't talk black, don't look black, don't act mm. black, right? Like assimilation was key. And so there's a lot of healing happening in my adulthood. And I'm curious, like, you know, you called yourself a seed planter. And, uh, you know, the thing, the thing that came out of this conversation for me was this, this concept of healing. It feels so healing mm. to hear this, right? So I'm curious, in your work, as you navigate this world, how you're seeing healing rise from it and what words you may have for those of us who are still healing internalized racial violence. Mm. First of all, thank you for, for sharing that and offering that. And my disclaimer is... I am expert on one thing and one thing only, and that is being Asia Upchurch, and I even still need to phone a friend and would appreciate a 3D printed version to solve some of the crises that come along with that. I will say, um, in college, I had a professor who was an older white gentleman who identified as a tax resistor and a pacifist and an activist, and he was so clear about naming his identity, the positionality, and the problematic power he's afforded. And for me, um, because I never thought about school robbing me of like being proud of being black, that was a moment for me to go like, oh, everybody has to do work to, to name who they are, to mm -hmm. call it out. And that, and this person who looked completely opposite for me was somehow actually also, and all the stuff that happened in my home neighborhood was really formative in me thinking about like what happens when I'm in the front of the classroom. Like I need to be able to stand up in front of my students and have a clear articulation of who I am for my own continuing like affirmation. And I also want to call out that it's um, a potentially like huge uh, eclipsing element, right? Because I don't want to also say that I know what every experience as a black woman is. Um, but I do want to own that this is how I name who I am um, and hoping that that can encourage folks to be able to name who they are. There's a quote that I won't try to like go verbatim, but um, I believe it's, um, is it Maxine Green? No, 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 it's um, Adrian Gil, not, no, not that Adrian, Gilbert. Okay, anyway, I ain't say this, but y'all can uh, Google the words psychic disequilibrium. No, I'm not going to spell those, although I was a spelling bee champ. <laughs> but she says psychic disequilibrium happens when the power, like you know who you are and how you name yourself, but, but other systems or people won't do it. And it causes this thing to make you think, well, am I even who I dare to say I am? And so a lot of the practice and that healing, I will say, is like every day I have to assure myself who I am. I have a morning meditation routine that is mine. I will not take a call. I will not do a meeting before I've done what I need to do to make sure that I'm not being as much as possible unintentionally poisonous because we've all grown up in this system that will try to minimize the fullness of who we are. Um, because I'm like, if a white man could be so real about what his whiteness has done and the problem with that, then I had better know that I can have 
take up every space to talk about the pride in who I am as a black woman. And I want students who are brown, who are mixed race, who are whoever to know that at least in my space, who you are is fully enough and to say that. So I say all of that to encourage folks to whatever the work we do behind the scenes, mm. <clears throat> there should be work behind the scenes for all of us to make sure that we can recover and reauthor the narrative of who we are away from the harm of all of the isms um, because that's gonna pour out of our, of our skin and, and hopefully be support for any type of healing journey. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next to you. Uh, my question is for Chiclet. Uh, I'm Cuban. Uh, I came from Cuba at the age of 15, man, and I'm a teacher. Uh, I also wanted to be an admin five years ago. So I started working on my PhD. Um, throughout my whole life, you know, I graduated from UConn. Um, my whole life I've been told that I needed to be less ghetto. Mm -hmm. That was like the big thing, right, in Connecticut. Like, you needed to be less ghetto. My college professor came up to me and I said, how can I be a better teacher? And his answer was, be less ghetto. Talk less ghetto. Stop being less ghetto. That's when you become a better teacher. Uh, it's not so much of a question as a thank you that I want to give you guys because every time I come to these events and I see you guys being your authentic self, it makes me realize that I'm in the right path. Yes. And regardless yes. of whatever it is, man, like, hey, I... Like you look at me and you probably walk across the street because I'm a huge guy. <laughs> I dress like this, you know what I mean? Like, but I have a PhD. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like on my way to get that PhD and be a principal. But um, I always right. thought, man, I don't fit into the, like, I've been fighting with that mental battle, right? I don't fit into what everybody expects for a principal to look like. Good. All the kids in my school want to come to me uh, yes. to the point where... <laughs> I feel even the, some of the admin get jealous and be like, hey, don't yeah. spend so much time, yeah. right? Don't, don't be so close to your kids. Yeah. Like, you need to relax. Don't take so many chances. You're taking way too many chances, but I know that the kids come to me because I speak to them in a different way, different language. Yeah, you speak right? to them. My way. That's right. Yeah. So uh, seeing you like this, man, the way you dress, like, this is me. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm an art Hell teacher, yeah. too. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I do graphic design, I, I do murals, and the way that I became an artist was because I used to be part of a gang. I used to be part of the Latin Kings in New York. Oh, wow. And, you know, you got to get out of that life. I live in the project, so you had to choose what your poison was, right? Like, I didn't want to get beat up every day after school, so I had to do what I had to do, you know what I'm saying? But only <laughs> real people know what I'm talking about, you know? So having the chance to go to school, get away from all of that, and having a different perspective is, is so wonderful because I bring that different perspective into school. I did murals, I did graffiti, <laughs> you know, I, all, the, all those things, that's how I got into it, you know? But it's so nice because I feel, and for the past five years, like I said, it's been a, a battle. Because in one side you hear people telling you, this is how I want you to dress, mm -hmm. this is how I want you to look. And man, I mm -hmm. swear to God, I, I, I could dress up really nice too, and yeah. wear like all this stuff, but it's not yeah. me, it's not me, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Right. It's, just, it's just not me, like yeah. I've done it. And he doesn't feel like me, like like I feel good like this. Jordan's yeah. on, hat on, like yeah. you know, this is me. This is my culture, you know? Yeah. So seeing you doing this and being part of the admin dude, I, that that just makes me like wanna push forward. So thank you so much. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Not you. Alejandro about thank to make you, me cry. You, oh my gosh. Yeah. All right, we're gonna talk later. You might be on the den stage next year just, yeah. <laughs> just um, as an admin. Gotta exchange information. All right, who <laughs> who's next? St. Louis, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Eric. Uh, thanks so much for, for everything that you've shared. Uh, one thing that stuck with me is when Aisha, you said, uh, you talked about the cipher as a way that we might think about it in terms of rules that are not about compliance, but mm. about support. Mm. And I'm curious, in both of your work as artists, um, are there other spaces, structures, um, ways of being um, that feel similarly as as maybe lending lending spaces of support um, and presenting a way of thinking about uh, way, rules, for lack of a better word, of being together but not in compliance. Mm. I mean, 
It's a, in a really delightful way. I feel like it's becomes really difficult to try to bifurcate life as artist, life as educator. Um, I rarely introduce myself with any title or affiliation because I'm a legion to the United States of Asia. There's a lot. <laughs> Asia Upchurch Incorporated. There's a lot of stakeholders just right there, me, myself, and I. Um, but I say that because if I think about the practice of ciphering, right, if we think about it, it's indigenous, it's like, it predates all of these kind of Western constructs of how learning should happen or how peopling should happen. And so I find that in spaces, whether it's in faculty meetings and leadership meetings and administrative spaces, listening as if I'm in a cipher, like in a movement cipher is helpful because in a cipher, you can't just be like, I got this, I got these bars or I got these eight counts that I want to dance and I thought about them last night and I'm only thinking about them and I'm just going to do them. It's like you're not actually listening. Mm -hmm. um, and that's violent. And that is disruptive. That's harmful. And so I think about the way that for me Cypher is life shows up in how I even work with colleagues. I might not like the steps that they are doing, <laughs> literally or metaphorically. But my job is not to cut them off. So, cause I think that hurts other people's learning. Like you just still have to say like, I don't like what, I don't like it, but I, can I still listen in love? Um, is there a bigger goal that we share in where like, okay, maybe you didn't like what I said or you didn't like my idea or you didn't like my agenda item. I just think about again, how ciphering for me is really a whole ethos. I'm trying to, as my, to my best embody, but Particularly in the classroom, um, I feel like I'm about to put my auntie hat on for 22 seconds. Uh, not to be ageist, adultist, or what have you, but it's undeniable that the way that I grew up and the time and place and way that, that we are from, is it's less communal first. Like you can be engaged in a whole world and know a lot of people from the comfort of your phone. Mm. Um, and folks, um, I'm working with college students right now and I'm astounded, like they don't know, their instinct isn't to look at each other for support, but they're trying to like get off and like do their thing. But just like stand in a circle, be able to step in, support each other, even supporting each other vocally is like, oh. And so I think about like, I really feel like through the, whether it's in a lecture class or a dance course or a meeting, I'm just trying to help people come back to looking at each other. Like that's the, that's the goal. Um, and that's, it permeates through all parts of, the, of my life. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the idea of, of listening, right? Asking more questions. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think where I found success as an educator was in feedback, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I think I was comfortable with that because as an artist, I received feedback whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> yes. You know, like people told me how they felt about my art or, or my ideas. As a teacher, I embraced that because I knew that that was gonna help me get to, to my next level. Um, and so for me as, as a teacher and, and borrowing, you know, from other colleagues, as someone in the back of the room, Nuvia, created this beautiful, um, feedback, critical feedback structure where it, it made it comfortable, right? And it made it specific. And at High Tech High, there's that, um, we talk about kind, specific, and helpful, helpful. feedback, right? Um, and maybe it's universal, not unique to High Tech High, but that's where I learned it. <laughs> um, but these ideas of like, oftentimes feedback becomes so personal and, and in our feelings or emotions like how do we bring it back to like be specific to the work, right? So as a, as a community setting that norm of what are we talking about and then speaking to that versus the person, right? And I think again, going back to where we started, like it's actually pretty simple, you know, it's just things that we've never been taught or things that have never been modeled for us mm -hmm. by our adults in our household or in our classrooms mm -hmm. when we were their age. And I think for me, that's the other rule I tried to live by is to remember when I was in, in that seat, you know, and, and as, a, as a father, um, I'm, I'm in that mode of like, damn, like how did my parents feel? You know, or, or a conversation today that I had with my son, Damian, of, of 
you know, like this is how I tried to get one by a grandma. And I laughed when you said this earlier today because I was like, oh, damn, we really are a reflection of each other. <laughs> you know, so it's moments like that, right, where we focus on the human in front of us um, and really, like, celebrate them. Mm-hmm. Hey, thank you both so much. Um, I want to know, uh, Chicle, you mentioned uh, the 90s uh, graffiti scene of San Diego, which people mm-hmm. might be mm-hmm. unfamiliar with more widely. So you can go there or you can go somewhere else. It's a question for both of you. Who's somebody who's an artist defined broadly, any field, who's really influenced you, who just more people should know about? Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that is so good. Mm-hmm. You should go first, Chicle. Uh, well, for me, it's my dad. You know, because my dad, like I said, he came here with... I, I honestly, I need to ask him, like, why, right? And I, I know why, for opportunity and a better life, um, quote, unquote. Um, but he he is the spirit of just go for it, right? Like he didn't go, I mean, he has an education up to sixth grade in Guadalajara, Mexico, came to Tijuana when he was 16. He, he was working since he was a kid selling kites and, and water on the soccer field. Like like this dude is a hustler, right? But he also had, he's so charismatic that even today with his, you know, broken English, like he walks into a room, like if y'all met him, He's walking out with you as a friend, you know, and, and so I grew up seeing him paint in our in our kitchen, you know, which is funny because my wife and I paint in our dining room. Um, and he's the first artist I knew and who encouraged me without any real education as an artist or training as an artist. He just went for it and did what he did. You know, so I would love for y'all to meet him. Um, yes. If you ever come back to San Diego, please reach out. And I'll, we'll do a little carne asada so you can see him. Um, that would be my answer. Oh, yeah, sis, you know, I heard the question, but being the Pisces and creative that I am, <laughs> going to respond with more than one because I just can't. Um, <laughs> Like, if I laugh because I become more and more of my mother, um, and it's, like, all her fault because she's involved in, like, music and theater, and you're just, like, back in the theater, like, the little kid in the back playing. But nobody ever explained the world of being a professional artist to me, so mm. um, understanding that did not come until much later. And I think there are a few folks who um, had indelible marks on me because of how... They do not hide that they are artists and the the world that that opened up for them. Um, so I do feel like if James Baldwin and Nina Simone had had some weird affair, I'd be their child. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, that's on the podcast, Asia. Okay. I got nothing to hide. It's my truth. Um, there's a dance company called Urban Bush Woman, and I saw them dance when I was 23 in it, and I shortly thereafter saw Rennie Harris. And it changed my life as a, a dark-skinned black girl who never had hair that was cascading down nobody's back, who has an athletic build that was policed by my ballet teacher earlier in life, though I could outturn everybody. My body was critiqued and criticized and policed um, as a girl who was born with her feet almost completely turned in and bow legs to the point that they wanted to break and reset. Dance, beyond what I knew, was healing my relationship with my body because I always felt completely whole and grounded. Um, but it's the outside world that's like, your hair ain't long enough, your nose too mm. wide, you to- too dark, and trying to put a black skin girl in pink tights when she's growing up, it does something to you when you're in the like Western performance world as a little chocolate girl and you're like, this makeup don't work, these tights don't work, this, b- I still have blush phobia, if that's a word we can create. <laughs> Um, And I'm in my mid-40s, and that's how long that lasted. So when I was 23 and I skipped a rehearsal to go see Urban Bushwoman, it's because I I think my spirit needed to let me know that there are women who look like you, and it is a company of predominantly, like, of women of color who are in every different shape and size, hair, every which way, and they are gorgeous. 
That's right. And they are beautiful. And the dance was legible to me. I was like, this movement that my body has known to do. And that has such a huge impression on me where I was like, I think I have to stop having this thing be a hobby. I think it is my conduit. I think I can do it. And Jennifer Archibald is the last person I mentioned. She's about a six foot tall um, black mixed race woman from um, Canada. Canada, and I had an experience working with her, and I had never met anyone who was so on fire for what they did. Like, she demanded that you care without being mean. It just poured out of her. And she's like, you could do this, Asia. It wasn't solicited. But I think something she recognized that I was at this moment, like, I need to dance as my primary conduit. And I quit my job in education and went into dance full time. Don't, um, kids, don't. Don't do that necessarily, but I say all of that because if I think about what success means, and we're talking a little bit about mm. like that, success is like, is there alignment between your passion and how you live? What you do, blah, 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 I'm saying how you live. And those folks were the embodiment of alignment. They didn't try to hide their bodies, they didn't try to hide their art form, and they've been able to reach people beyond like traditional learning, and so for me, these artists who are in bodies that the world police, which is again why I cannot police, I can't be a police of bodies. I experienced that. I just unlocked the world of possibility for me. And so I try to honor what those folks have pour, poured into me without even knowing that it is okay to take up the space that I'm in and the body that I'm in. I'm here to do that. And so like, that was a long um, response, but it's my truest response. Mm. Hmm. Can I? Uh, and while you get to the next one, um, that idea of success, uh, the opening keynote, I know hopefully y'all were there. Um, there was a comment that was made about success often looks like by the distance you place between who you are or, or where you were raised and how far away from that you go, right? And I, I think hearing you talk about that, like what, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and what, who, who is success and why? Um, I, I think that's so important that we we redefine what that looks like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I think, too, like the question of who, who are some folks that people should know about is like even looking in this room, there, there's folks in here that we need to know. Um, and that's true in, in all of your spaces is there's people in the room who you might not actually know, you know, what their story is, where they come from, what they're doing, you know, and asking those questions as well. Um, that's success. Yeah. I think these will be our last two. You, you have to yeah. up and you go get last two. Oh. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so I'll try to get to a question, but what I've been kind of honing in as I'm taking notes is this idea of creativity. And to kind of get to where I want to arrive at, you know, I'm kind of taking notes around, you know, creativity as a leader to me means spontaneity with. Uh, developed and responsive intentionality. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as a leader in a building, in a community, in a classroom, the thoughtfulness that goes into promoting, putting forth ideas, how that has impacted where you are, what you do. Um, speaking as somebody that sometimes spits out too many ideas, mm. but also wanting to encourage more ideas. And that kind of uh, artist approach where we have, a, we have an idea going into something, you might even think of your fixed materials or mindset or whatever you had in mind. And then you have a blank canvas or with dance, you have an idea that you're gonna start out with but you haven't started dancing yet. But the moment you put your first step or you put your first color down, yeah. then you're, you're going. And where you end up might not be where you originally thought. And I guess mm. to bring it back into a school, mm -hmm. is there intentional promotion of staff ideas, what it means to change or transform uh, the culture, the, you know, we talked about staff meetings, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we, you know, whether, how a school schedule is, yeah. um, how we give and receive feedback between admin and, and teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, these are big ideas that I think as artists, I feel fortunate that I can look at them from multiple different angles and I also want to bring that from other people, and, and, and I'm wondering how that um, plays out for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, listen, as a performer, as a choreographer and a performer, every piece ain't it, even if I put it on stage. But I need the process. It took me three years to get one piece right. But I didn't get it right in rehearsal. I have to put it on stage. Dancers give feedback, what have you. I say that gives me my performer artist identity. I'm thankful that I don't displace it as unimportant to my life as a human because it gives me the gift of I have a high threshold for non-resolve, for unresolved. I have a high threshold for understanding that evolution is inevitable. Our idea and mindset around changing habits so that evolution can happen. I have a high threshold for like, this gonna take some time. But I also, because of ciphering, I go, I get it. Some people not quite understanding the flow of the music. And as much as I want to jump in and take the needle off the record and be like, yo, it's this way. Um, I also know, sorry. Whoa, my <laughs> Compliance. personality just jumped out there. Sorry, sorry, friends. Um, I also know, I, I'm thankful that my artistic pre practice has gifted me like completely unremovable um, thresholds and tolerances and mindsets even around what it means to navigate change in a system. I've designed, I've helped co-design a graduate program at one of the most quote unquote elite institutions on the planet. I've developed courses and projects that didn't exist in spaces that didn't think that it could exist. And that is because I understand that inevitably Experimentation and ideation has to live out. It cannot, it is not meant to be just in an intellectual activity. It has to be practice. Sometimes it's gonna be a hot mess, but it has to have a hot mess. Getting people to understand that in the climate of education from K-12 to, to, to higher ed, unfortunately, those systems are not built with a threshold of tolerance for time as time actually happens. So that yeah. is the dissonance to cheer and cultivate patience mm -hmm. inside of a system that is obsessed with microwave results that are unrealistic. Um, so that's where just trying to not necessarily lose sight of what, what the big idea is. I think we have to keep our eyes on that, but also go, this is gonna, it should be. It's like, I can legit, I, like if there's turbulence on a plane, it makes sense, we're traveling through a weather system. If there ain't no weather system, like wait, well, ho, 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 this, this pilot is incompetent, right? But if we can understand there's gonna be, we have to, you have to, we have to condition our muscles that creativity and collaboration, they don't just sound beautiful, but they are processes mm -hmm. when working in systems that are gonna invite us to go like, can you get your threshold for non-resolution up? Can you go train that muscle a little bit? Can you discipline your ear to sit in the cipher and be like, ooh, that person ain't quite on beat yet, but they gonna get there, they gonna get there. Or do you know how to join them in the circle? <laughs> you know, so I, mm -hmm. again, it's, for me, it's like I don't, I don't separate them because I, I'm so glad that I can bring my artistic practice into leadership positions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think all of that, and, and I would just add, like, embracing the disruption or, or helping adults unlearn things, right, and, and empowering them more than ever to be able to pivot, you know? And, and I think even for our, our students who have dreams and aspirations, for them to be okay with, you know, perhaps something changes, they change, they evolve, you know, and pursue a different path. Because sometimes our, our young people feel like if, if they don't achieve what they said they were gonna achieve, then it's failure, mm. you know? So how do we remove that pressure, even from our, our colleagues in the classrooms of, if things don't go as you planned, it's okay. What can you take away from that and then pivot to the next thing? You know, so really about empowering our, our colleagues, our teachers, our teams, and then our students to, to be comfortable with, you know, sometimes things don't work out or, or things happen and how do we address that? How do we, you know, someone earlier mentioned healing. I, I, I think it really is about us healing as, as humans, you know, because there's been so much that's been happening and not like it, it just started happening. It's been happening, mm -hmm. but somehow now it's at the forefront in a conversation that we're all having about all human beings embrace that space and, and truly though make the time to work with your teams to empower one another so that then they could do the work with the kids
Okay, we have, this will be like a really brief question and a really brief response. <laughs> And then the final words. <laughs> or just go for it, because y'all are yeah. creative. That's how we were going to start reject out. reject yeah. the rules. <laughs> I'll set a timer. How's it going? Thank you both Good. for your time. Um, my name is Usman. I'm a poet, and I'm also Mass Poetry's board chair. Hey! Uh, nice. And being in this uh, administrative role has just added so much depth to my relationship with poetry. Um, but at mm. the same time, I haven't had a chance to be in the classroom as much as I would like. So even at this conference when I was doing a workshop, so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, so my main question is, how has your relationship with your art changed over time? And where do you see that going? Yeah. Dude, like, like masses in Massachusetts? Yep, Massachusetts. Yeah, I just left there. I know exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good scene. Anyway, okay. Um, I will say this is, this is a beautiful question because, again, I don't separate the two. So that means I also have to leave open, like, can my art learn from this other side? And Cypher is life. Um, transforming classrooms into communities. I like to do a little mm. challenge with myself, like how quickly can I help coach a space to shift from being transactional to being humanizing and transformative um, on my classrooms to feel like a cookout every day. Mm. Also, there's always food in my classrooms because the pedagogy of hunger <laughs> and biology actually rules the world, okay? Um, so I say that because now my artwork is shifting from, I'm okay with like theater, proscenium performances, but the work and the process has become so much more about collaborative processes with the performers and I actually wanna do more theater stage work but put it into communal spaces to engage people where they are and to make theater and dance and art with the community because I do believe it's healing. So. Um, and trying to transition transactional faculty meetings into like, can we like get a, have an agenda, but also be human? I'm like, can the mm. theater actually come back, particularly to communities of color? Can it not just be entertainment, but can we reclaim the power that it innately has to heal us for us? So it's, it's I'm coming back home again. Homecoming is another track of my EP. <laughs> I'm coming back home to community. The single. Yeah, uh, I think for me, the, the same. Um, my art, ha I mean, it's evolved from when I first started in 2004 as a, as a professional artist in a gallery setting. Um, but I've embraced it, and I left a little souvenir for you all on your chairs. Um, but the idea, like the visual aspect of art and, and the messages it could, could share, the conversations that they could spark, um, I'm really taking that and, and running with it. Um, my space that most people call an office, you know, I call a gallery and I have art by professional artists as well as student artists that I've had over the years. Um, so like really like showing up as everything that I am, everything that I love. So like low rider culture, things that in, in past times, you know, were like, we don't talk about that because those are all gang members. Um, that's not true, you know, it's, it's about identity and expression, just like music, you know, so there's a, a, a speaker in my office always playing music. I try to be mindful of the language, um, but like, like everything, <laughs> yeah, like I try to bring it into everything. And, yes. and as, as you mentioned, like, I, I think my relationship with art is also my therapy. So as I, Aisha mentioned, her morning routine for me is creating art. You know, if I'm not creating, if I'm not drawing, if I'm not coming up with something, um, and I don't feel whole. So going out into the community, painting, doing events, vending, you know, I try to keep myself busy. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's there, alive. All right, and now you both have 60 seconds to share Ooh, any final 60. parting words <laughs> um, <laughs> or something else. So I have a mantra that I developed. I just moved to Texas and I relearned the importance of hydration because damn! That's just the devil breathing on you in August. Um, so because I felt like I was also about to die, I was like, oh, I got to hydrate, baby. We got to hydrate. We got to what? We got to hydrate. So what I would like to do is um, impart my motto with everyone in my last 15 seconds, if you would not mind um, standing or doing what you want to do. I'm going to stand. But uh, repeat after me. Hydrate. Hydrate. Booty shake. Booty shake. And do something that brings you joy. And do something that brings you joy. Now take eight counts to booty shake or shake it out or do something that's joyful in your body. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Hydrate with joy. Hydrate with joy. Yes. That's my TED Talk. Okay. <laughs>
Hydrate, booty saying. shake, and do something that brings you joy. And double hydrate, points if hydrating booty while booty shaking is your joy. Yeah. Nice. Can you print that it. on something? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, go got a viral. You. I got okay. you. Um, yeah, I would say just follow your instincts. You know, like you all chose this path for a reason. Um, it's intentional that you're here in this space, even with us. So thank you for choosing our, yes. our den talk today. You know, thank you for coming to San Diego and, and participating. I think so. Continue on that. And, and yesterday, uh, we were talking to a, a, someone from Chicago, actually, and, and they, Nuvia asked them like three words to talk, like describe your experience so far. And the, the first thing this, this colleague said was affirmative. You know, so hopefully throughout these three days, you t you're taking something back that like, you know, like, yes, follow that path, become an administrator, come back and do this den talk. Like, like that's what we all need, right? Yeah. We need to see more people like us talking about what, what it looks like to be in these spaces. Cause I would have never imagined, like I, rest in peace, but I disliked my vice principal in high school, like really bad, right? I try to be all the opposite of that. And I shared a story like that. I was exactly him the first week in the role. So <laughs> like just follow your instincts, you know, be a, an amazing human being that you already are and reach out if y'all ever need anything. Ashe, for sure. Let's give Aisha and Chicle one more round of applause. 